Okay, great. Hey everyone, um, thank you for coming to Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations and Environmental Justice, the Impacts of Factory Farming. Uh, I first wanna give a really uh, quick shout out to the Animal on Policy Program for um, providing the amazing lunch. Um, so really quickly, I'm gonna introduce our speakers and then we're gonna dive in to um, some questions moderated uh, by me, unfortunately, some of our uh, other representatives from the Food Law uh, Society, the Animal Law uh, Society, uh, have uh, has some health issues and some COVID has been taking us down. So I'll be only the only one up here. My name's Skipper. I'm uh, one of the co-presidents of the uh, Environmental Law Society, um, and we'll also have some time for uh, you all to ask questions at the very end. Um, so quickly, we're joined by three uh, amazing panelists today. Um, first, uh, Sherry White. Williamson is the current director of environmental justice strategy at the North Carolina Conservation Network. Uh, prior to starting her role uh, there, she worked in the Office of Environmental Justice at the EPA, and she now leads North Carolina Conservation Network's efforts to connect uh, impact community-led campaigns and organizations with decision makers to foster environmental justice and ensure healthy, sustainable communities. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Sherry. Thank you. Lee Miller is a lecturing fellow at Duke Law School, teaching food, agriculture, and the environment. And he's written extensively on CAFOs, environmental justice, and animal welfare, the Farm Bill, and food justice. He is also currently the policy director for April Policy, a nonprofit and community toolshed with uh, implements for direct action and policy entrepreneurship to advance equitable and sustainable farming. Lee also developed the Farm Bill Law Enterprise, a farm bill research project to advance agricultural sustainability, racial uh, and economic justice, and rural resilience. Thank you, Lee, for coming. Thanks for having me. And finally, uh, Alexis Andaman is a senior attorney with the Sustainable Food and Farming Program at Earth Justice based in New York. Uh, prior to joining Earth Justice, she completed fellowship to the Conservation Law Center and the clinic at Indiana University's Mars School of Law and the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, and uh, Alexis and I had I was had a fantastic opportunity to work with Alexis this fall, and she is amazing. And I'm really excited that you were able to join us as well. Um, so why don't we quickly just start with an overview of um, CAFOs or concentrated animal feeding operations and some of their uh, environmental and health impacts? Um, does anyone want to uh, just? I don't know if this turned off. Oh, here we go. We really want to start by just giving us an overview of, of CAFOs and the environmental and health impacts uh, of CAFOs on the surrounding communities and the surrounding environments. Um, the concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, by definition, are operations that have a thousand animals or more in a confined area. Um, what we have in North Carolina with the CAFOs are that there are thousands of animals, not just a, a one or 2,000, as Lee can probably talk to a little bit later. Um, but the problem with that is that these animal operations are predominantly located in communities of color or low-income communities, which creates um, a greater health impact because most of these communities or members of these communities already have pre-existing conditions um, and the exposure to um, those animals just make those pre-existing pre conditions worse. Um, there is a huge amount of air pollution, obviously um, water pollution, both associated with the well water um, that most of the residents are on because they are in rural areas as well as um, the spray fields that are associated with um, the lagoons, which are huge um, cesspools or pits the size of several football fields. And in order to keep um, that waste level down in those lagoons, as we refer to them, they have to spray um, that waste on the adjoining fields from time to time to help reduce that. So that adds further to um, the air contamination, as well as creating the problems um, with the water contamination. Um, and so that's that's basically the issue, as well as some other issues that I hope we'll get a chance to get into later um, that have to do with what the industry is now, in, now um, doing with the hog waste, um, supposedly to make the environment better. And I'll give it to you, Lee, or to Alexis to, to add to that. 
I can add a few things, Alexis, and then and then you can jump in and fill in the gaps. Um, I, I think that Cherry, of course, covered what what has deservedly received kind of the bulk um, or a lot of attention, especially in in recent years, which is the what I think of as the particularly localized environmental impacts um, of these operations, especially because they, as Sherry mentioned, are, are located um, disproportionately in low-income communities and communities of color. Um, there are a couple of other categories when I think of environmental harms that are also important to keep on your radar. The first, I think, is animal welfare and the just the hard conditions um, that these non-human animals are living in, uh, whether they're poultry or pigs um, or, or cattle in feedlots. Uh, and then a kind of a other big issue, which is which Sherry um, foreshadowed, uh, is the sort of global, um, specifically climate impact of these operations, um, specifically around their emission of methane, but um, and nitrous oxide. Um, but that's something that I'm sure we'll get to later on as well. Alexis, what have I left out? Nothing left out. I think that's a great background. A few things to uh, add. EPA admits that CAFOs cause disproportionate harm to communities of color and economically disadvantaged communities. So that's a pretty well-established fact. There is a huge body of scientific evidence showing that that's the case. Um, <clears throat> My organization, Earth Justice, recently had a chance to work with Sherry and the NC Conservation Network, as well as about 50 other groups, um, on a petition that involved an expert report. So we analyzed CAFO locations around the country in North Carolina, in California's Central Valley, where dairy CAFOs are concentrated, and in Iowa, where there are also a lot of swine CAFOs. We found um, that CAFOs cause environmental justice harms in each one of those areas. In California, for example, we found that if white people were exposed to CAFOs at the same rate as Hispanic people, to use the language of the US Census, about 200,000 fewer Hispanic people would live close to CAFOs. Um, so that's an example of the type of harm that we see across the country. In Iowa, where you don't see the kind of uh, racial diversity that you see in North Carolina and in the Central Valley, we found that CAFOs tend to be clustered in the most rural areas, which means they're located in communities where folks don't have the same kind of access to grocery stores or opportunities for indoor exercise or doctor's office, which as Sherry says, makes folks more susceptible to harms from CAFO pollution and less able to protect themselves. I think we're gonna get into regulation, but one, one quick thing to add is those are sort of examples of the direct harm. Um, EPA's failure to regulate CAFOs properly means that it's very difficult for people who live next to CAFOs to actually get involved in the decision-making process. Um, many CAFOs don't have to comply with the transparency requirements they would have to comply with if they were properly regulated under environmental laws. They don't have to share information with their neighbors, and they don't have to create opportunities for neighbors to get involved in the permitting process in the same way they might have to if they were property regulated. So that's uh, that's another environmental justice problem to flag. And I think another part of that problem, as Alexis alluded to, is the fact that these are communities that don't normally have access to decision makers and, and centers of power. Um, so they have very little way to influence um, the decisions that are made about where they live or what comes into their communities. And in a lot of cases would not even know how to access those sort of centers of power to, to make those changes happen. Thank you. There, there are a lot of threads that uh, we'd love to pull on. I think those were some fantastic answers, and hopefully we can we can uh, dive into some of that more. And I think Sherry, that's a perfect transition um, to talking about some of the kind of, uh, now that we've highlighted some of the distributional uh, disparities and injustices, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about, about the procedural injustices, um, and specifically, um, if we could talk a little bit more about the decision-making process for approving inside new CAFOs or uh, the opportunities for impacted communities um, historically to have a voice in the decision making process and also any any work uh, that you all are doing in expanding the procedural uh, opportunities and, and the procedural voice of, of impacted communities neighboring these state votes. Was that a question to anyone in particular? 
No, sorry. Um, if, okay. if anyone would like to top in, but I can also um, I can also uh, see if anyone wants to. I, I can pull a name if, if you would like to start. But I, I guess Sherry, since, since you were uh, kind of alluded to that in, in your your promoted answer, would you mind starting us off? Um, I was almost going to defer to Lee, who's probably done that a little more than I have. Um, but procedurally, um, the problem is that communities generally don't get much of an opportunity to speak by the time they have the opportunity um, to have their say at a public hearing. Um, decisions are so far along the way being made that there's not a lot that can be done here in North Carolina. Um, right now, the uh, North Carolina NACP, I'm sorry, the Dupin County branch of the North Carolina NACP, um, the North Carolina Poor People's Campaign um, have filed a Title VI complaint on behalf of uh, communities in Duplin and Sampson County because of the digesters that, uh, or the general permit that was issued for digesters to be placed on hog lagoons. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, toward the end. Um, the organization that I co-founded, which we haven't talked about at all, is called EJ Can. It's in Sampson County. Um, and we formed it for the purpose of education, but also for the purpose of creating uh, some activism around these issues. And our organization, along with Cape Fear River Watch, um, have filed an administrative complaint, or actually two administrative complaints, with the North Carolina um, Office of Administrative Hearings challenging procedurally um, what DEQ did in order to decide to issue both the individual permit first for four farms and then the general permit, um, which they were ordered to do by in the farm 19 in the 2021 farm bill by the General Assembly. Um, to create this general one size fits all permit to provide any farm um, who's interested in capturing the methane from the hog waste to turn it into, as they call it, renewable natural gas, um, which is more greenwashing, um, uh, to, to try and make them take another look um, at, uh, at that, th that permit process. Um, and there were things, Lee, I'm sure that you can talk about from before I came back to the state. I mean, I think, but I want to highlight big picture, and, and this is something that Alexis alluded to, is the, the utter lack of useful information um, that advocates have, that communities have. I mean, we're really, in many cases, in the dark um, about the nature of these factory farms, where they are, how big they are, how they're managing all of this waste. Um, that, you know, that's not universally true. I've, I've worked on a report for NRDC a couple of years ago that tried to map out what do we know about these operations kind of state to state? What do we know? What does EPA know? It turns out EPA probably knows even less than we know um, in many cases, which we should all be a little scared about. And there have been efforts in the past, very basic efforts to, to have a sort of national um, accounting of where are the CAFOs and how big are they and what kind of animals and industry has managed to shut that down um, every time that that's come up. Um, so I, the way that that, you know, works in the real world is in North Carolina, we at least know where all of the pig CAFOs are, where all the hogs are, because um, we haven't had a really, we haven't had a new pig farm built since the late 1990s when a moratorium went into place, which is why Iowa now has three times as many pigs as we do, um, although less concentrated. Um, but when it comes to poultry, it's the wild west over here. Um, folks are building million, five million bird um, operations in Sherry's backyard, uh, and there's really no procedural um, process in place let alone to inform the community, but to, to put any sort of um, actual regulations on them. They're, you know, under state law, they're essentially deemed permitted uh, if they meet a couple of basic uh, construction requirements. Um, so, it, you know, there, you can put all the, you can have all the procedure you want, but if we don't have a, a way to use it, um, because we don't even know that these operations are in existence, then um, I would say that's step one, is, is closing that information gap, um, that information loophole. Alexis, what do you have to add? 
think it's in case it's helpful to take one more step back. Good, good. One reason why it's really difficult to find information about CAFOs is CAFOs tend to be either directly exempted or exempted according to interpretations of bedrock environmental laws. Um, so one basic example, under the Clean Water Act, CAFOs are expressly identified at as point sources, which means if they discharge water pollution, which with some confusing exemptions that we don't necessarily have to get into, but for the most part, if they discharge water pollution, they require a permit under the Clean Water Act. Clean Water Act permits uh, need to meet certain basic transparency requirements. So any entity with a Clean Water Act permit has to share information about its operations with the public, and there need to be opportunities for public hearings. So anyone who wants to talk about a Clean Water Act permit with regulators has an opportunity to do that. Um, nationwide, only about a third of the largest CAFOs have Clean Water Act permits, which is pretty surprising. That's not the case for other industries that routinely discharge water pollution, and that's a major source of the problem. If you are operating under a state permitting scheme, which many CAFOs do, or no permitting scheme at all, you're not sharing the kind of basic information that folks need to just understand what kind of risk they face. Uh, without Clean Water Act permits, it's really difficult to know how many animals a CAFO can find, how much waste it's generating, what it plans to do with that waste, where exactly it's going, and how we can be confident that those locations can actually incorporate the amount of animal feces that we're planning to apply to them. So that's a key problem under the Clean Water Act. There are similar problems under almost every other law. So Lee and Sherry have both mentioned that CAFOs emit enormous quantities of air pollution. EPA acknowledged in 1998 that air pollution from CAFOs constitutes a major public health problem. But 25 years later, CAFOs are still not required to report their air emissions under the Clean Air Act. They're not required to report emissions under the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, and they're not required to report under EPGRA, which is the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act. Um, both CERCLA and EPGRA are focused on getting information about dangerous quantities of pollution to the people who are likely to be exposed to that pollution so they can protect themselves and so uh, medical workers can provide the kind of help they need to provide. And there are similar exemptions and failures to regulate having to do with the generation and spread of dangerous pathogens that happens at CAFOs, which use enormous quantities of antibiotics, having to do with the contributions to climate change that we've discussed. So uh, this lack of information is really a pervasive problem, and it's something that could be addressed <laughs> with the laws that we have if regulators were focused on making sure that CAFOs are getting the kind of permits they need. Alexis, I love that you're, uh, you're anticipating my next question, which was going to talk a little bit more about the regulatory framework of, of CAFOs and kind of the uh, fundamental exemptions for many of the bedrock environmental laws uh, that govern um, clean air and clean water that you've already uh, mentioned. So can you just uh, parse out a little bit more what existing regulatory structure there is that um, at the federal level that provides an opportunity to, to regulate CAFOs and then um, how that looks across different states for, for these pretty favorable kind of box checking exercises to get permitting um, and how that plays out uh, in the permitting process and, and in um, the, the impacts um, on, on fees and the environment. Sure. I'll, I'll use the Clean Water Act as an example because this is such a pervasive problem that it's difficult to, to talk about failures to regulate under every environmental law. Um, like I said, CAFOs are point sources. If they discharge water pollution, they should have a permit. EPA has known for decades that there's a huge problem with under permitting of CAFOs. EPA knows that CAFOs discharge water pollution and they do it without permits. And the fact that they discharge without permits causes environmental justice harms. EPA admitted that most recently in May 2020. The problem, according to EPA, is that it can't require CAFOs to get the permits they need because EPA just doesn't have the resources to go out and prove that every single CAFO is discharging. Um, and that's sort of a result of 
a number of things, but in part the fact that CAFOs don't operate like most factories. They're industrial facilities, but they don't typically have pipes that hang out over a stream and let water pollution out all the time. They tend to discharge predictably and routinely, but sporadically. Um, and as Sherry mentioned, CAFOs tend to be really densely concentrated <laughs> near one another, which means if you go out and collect a water sample and you prove that there is swine feces in the water, it can be really difficult to say that discharge came from CAFO A 10 feet upstream and not CAFO B 20 feet upstream or 500 feet upstream. So there are serious problems of proof. EPA has tried a couple of times to publish rules that would require more CAFOs to get Clean Water Act permits. Um, and both times those rules have been struck down by circuit courts. Um, courts have said, that EPA has gone too far. The, the Clean Water Act is focused on regulating discharges, not industries. And courts have said that when EPA tries to get more CAFOs to apply for Clean Water Act permits, what it's doing is targeting industry and not targeting a particular discharge. Um, along with the NC Conservation Network, we just submitted a petition asking EPA to adopt a regulatory presumption that large CAFOs using wet manure management systems discharge water pollution um, and therefore require Clean Water Act permits. So that's, that's one effort that EPA hasn't tried to address this problem to get more CAFOs into the Clean Water Act permitting scheme. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that, but that's, that's sort of the difficulty. There is you know, there are exemptions written into the law. There is a huge reluctance to regulate animal agriculture and agriculture more broadly because we like farmers. Farmers happens, you know, farming happens in almost every state. There's not, there are not many lawmakers who are eager to pick a fight with farmers. We tend to have an image of bucolic red barns and green fields and grazing cattle. Um, and it's very difficult for people to acknowledge that CAFOs are industrial facilities uh, that need to be regulated like industrial facilities. And I think also on the regulatory side, if we look at the Clean Air Act, there are certain uh, pollutants that are criteria pollutants under the Clean Air Act. Methane does not happen to be one of those. And these CAFOs emit huge amounts of methane, which is one of the reasons why um, flying CAFOs now are putting digesters on to collect the methane to make money off of that. Um, there's been a petition at EPA for over a year now to make methane a criteria pollutant under the Clean Air Act, and that isn't going any place either. So um, as Alexa said, it's very difficult. The industry is very powerful, um, and it's very difficult to, to see changes happen. Um, I saw it happen when I was at EPA. There's a huge reluctance um, to regulate some industries for fear of the type of blowback that will happen if uh, a decision is made um, to regulate an industry. I don't have much to add to that. Um, that's a really good overview of the two major sort of safe harbors or the environmental anti-law as we call it. Um, that CAFOs enjoy. I mean, what I what I would add is Alexis isn't kidding when she says, like, it's hard to tell whether pollution is coming from a farm five feet upstream or 50 feet upstream. If you, I, I'm sure most of you are sitting in front of a laptop at this moment. If you, if you bring up Google Maps and you bring up Sampson County, North Carolina, where Sherry lives, and you turn on the satellite view, the satellite layer, and just kind of look around Sampson County, what you'll find is a landscape that is completely covered in concentrated animal feeding operations. You'll see the long barns stacked on top of each other. And you can tell what's a, a hog, um, what's a hog farm by whether it has a lagoon and the ones that don't have lagoons are, are poultry operations. Oh, that's a, that's a great map. Yeah, it's very helpful. That's um, pretty astonishing. So I want I want to give us plenty of time to have student questions at the very end. So I might um, jump around a little bit uh, in our in our questions to be prepared. I think one thing that that uh, I know we haven't gotten to that that we alluded to is and Sherry you just talking about uh, anaerobic digesters and and Lee at the start you were talking about kind of the like climate justice climate justice impacts of capos and in, in industrial agriculture um, and industrial animal agriculture. 
I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the the anaerobic digestion, the um, natural gas from um, CH4 coming from methane coming from um, some of these animal farms, and I guess essentially what what your views are on on the validity of some of these efforts and and their um, actual efficacy as, as climate solutions versus whether you think they might more be more uh, more greenwashing than they are um, valuable climate solutions. Do you want me to start, Cherry? Um, yeah, I, oh, so I mean, biogas is, is the thing that, I don't know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about, um, and I imagine Alexis and Sherry do as well. The, maybe it's worth just starting from the top, right? There, when we talk about livestock, we can break them down into ruminants and non-ruminants. Um, and basically there's cattle and, and sheep to a lesser extent in this country um, that produce prodigious amounts of methane just by virtue of being alive because of the type of digestive system that they have. Um, not a whole lot that you can do about that if you wanna have, um, if you wanna have hamburger or lamb chops. Um, then there's the methane that is produced by the management of the manure itself. So you put pigs on pasture um, and they, you know, they, they poop and pee on the pasture that doesn't create much like negligible, basically negligible amount of, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, when done properly. Uh, on the other hand, if you, uh, take, you know, the, the excreta from 5,000 pigs and put it into a open air lagoon where it's anaerobically digesting along with the urine and rainwater and, um, everything else, then you get a tremendous amount of methane that was, would not have been produced otherwise. And of course, the same is true from, from cattle feces as well. So it's an additional source from, from the ruminant, um, ruminants that are raised in confinement. Uh, this is, methane is like kind of the hot, the hot greenhouse gas. Um, it's, you know, it, I think it's usually talked about as being 30 times more potent than CO2. Um, by weight. I, I think that's actually being revised. Like, uh, I think that's probably gonna, um, short term, it's, it's, it's even worse. And the, I think the factor is, you know, we're looking at 40 or 50 times worse kind of over its lifetime. Um, so big problem. I mean, I've written before and I'll say, I think I stand by this. If we're, if, if we're going to raise animals in confinement, we sure as hell need to deal with um, the methane, with the greenhouse gas pollution. Like we live in a we live in a world where we don't have any other choice. Um, the world is burning. Uh, that said, <laughs> um, there are lots of ways to to deal with methane, um, and the one that industry seems to have chosen as its preferred method is is bad for a number of different reasons, and I can briefly go over them. Um, so the the sort of what's we're seeing in eastern North Carolina is you take an open air it's a cesspool. We call it a lagoon for, for reasons that are, have always been a little unclear to me. Um, and we put a big tarp over it and we, we cover it. We cover the lagoon and over time it'll kind of pressurize and inflate and we'll stick a, a, a pipe in there, like a big straw, and we'll uh, let the methane kind of run out through that pipeline um, to a centralized facility. Oh, I'm getting a graphic. This is good. Um, that will clean it up. Uh, that will essentially purify it until it's, you know, pipeline grade um, natural gas, and then it will be injected into existing natural gas pipelines. Um, so used, you know, in your, uh, to heat your home or whatever. Uh, a number of problems here. One, um, that does absolutely nothing to address really any of the local environmental problems um, that Sherry mentioned at the top of um, of this panel. Uh, the, it probably does a little bit for odor. Um, that might be that might be a reasonable claim, but it, it essentially is doing nothing good for the, the folks who are living next to these facilities. And we think that it's probably actually going to make some of their problems worse um, for, for reasons that my chemistry colleagues can explain better than I can. Um, the, the sort of covering uh, Covering the lagoon turns it into a better 
um, it, it allows the digestive, the anaerobic digestive process to, to happen um, at a more pure level, which is essentially converting more of the nitrogen in um, the lagoon into, uh, into ammonia and ammonium, which causes the air pollution problems, and also into nitrate and nitrites, which are more um, soluble, more uh, uh, mobile sources of nitrogen pollution down into groundwater and into surface waters. The short of it is that covering lagoons um, is not solving the environmental justice problems that we've identified. It's also not solving any of the animal welfare problems that we identified. Um, and if anything, it's extending the life of this form of, um, of, of factory farming that most of us would agree uh, it needs to end or at the very least needs, um, needs to be reformed in a big way. So um, what you know, I think what Sherry and I have often uh, talked about and Alexis may, may agree or disagree is that at a bare minimum, um, what we want from a facility that's going to, to do digestion uh, is to take the money that is going to this new revenue stream that it's receiving and actually use that to install additional environmental technologies on these farms um, that will in fact deal with the air and water pollution problems um, that these farms cause. And I can certainly talk more about what that would look like, but I'm going to pause there and, and see what you have to add, Sherry. Sherry, I think you might be muted. I do that sometimes. Um, on a more local basis, as we think about these digesters and where they are placed, they're in the same communities that are already um, over impacted by not just CAFOs, but other types of, of industrial operations. So the process of adding an anaerobic digester to a lagoon only creates or uh, increases the exposures that these community members um, expect to have. They are, they are, in order to create the methane, they're also generating higher rates of ammonia. Um, as Lee said, nitrates, um, hydrogen sulfide, and all of the things that would really make the community worse, um, which means the leftover effluent or flu fluid from that digester that then gets dumped into an additional lagoon um, is more concentrated. And that first infographic that I put up of the look like a tractor spraying the field, now you have a more concentrated um, affluent that's being sprayed on the fields, which further exacerbates the types of pollutants that we're finding in, in well water um, in the local communities. We, um, in Sampson County, have been doing some water testing, and this is sort of ground zero for this whole digester uh, process in the state um, between Sampson and Duplin County. Um, two of the digester locations are within a mile of each other. Um, and they're hooking up farms that are as far as 19 miles away from the facility that is converting um, the methane into renewable natural gas as the industry wants to call it. Um, so we are seeing problems such as high levels of total coliform uh, in water, um, high levels of nitrates, arsenic, which is associated more with poultry than with, um, uh, than with swine. But all of these just further exacerbate a system where folks are already having to spend money that they can't afford to buy bottled water just because they don't feel like the well water. And in a lot of cases, the well water isn't safe. So the, the local impacts, while the industry is touting something that's better for the environment, there is a failure in talking about how much worse it is for the local community as a result of the constituents in this process that are, that are greatly increased rather than allowing that lagoon the, or the lagoon materials um, to degrade naturally um, in the air as they would do if this artificial system wasn't placed. Um, on top of these lagoons. The other concern that we have is the instability of this gas. Um, the gas company that I, that I get my gas from sent out letters um, about a month ago to inform all of us that they were infusing um, this swine renewable natural gas into the system already. Um, but there's still some questions about um, the stability um, 
um, of this gas. I am close enough to ride by the one of the facilities. The other one hasn't been completed yet. And I'm seeing flaring already, which tells me that, that that gas is not purified. So there's another impact to the local community in addition to everything else that they're experiencing to now be experiencing the additional flaring that's occurring as the um, impure gas is being, being burned off. Thank you so much, everyone. I think uh, I'd love, unless Alexis, you have, you have uh, anything about that, I, I'd love to move to uh, audience questions right now and, and see if anyone has any questions for, for the panel. Um, thanks for a very interesting talk. I'd like to ask for the panel's view on the environmental justice issues related with CAFOs at the institution rather than as a industrial facility. So the idea that we can create a food system that is contingent on using valuable agricultural land to produce food for animals and then feeding animals or animal byproducts to people is inherently problematic because it's, it's inefficient. But what it also does is has a number of economic consequences such as uh, squeezing out small scale farming, um, creating antibiotic resistance, uh, the risk of zoonotic disease spillovers, all of these things are very serious public policy concerns, but don't relate to any individual case per se, they relate to the structure of the industry. Could you talk to that for a moment, please? Are you asking about the structure of the system and how the impacts go further than just the health impacts? Is that is that the question? Yes, I'm saying so. Obviously, uh, these facilities are justified in terms of producing low cost food, but there are a range of economic externalities as well. Um, that are outside of the pricing of that food that typically also impact on vulnerable communities, not just environmental degradation, but you know the things I mentioned, antibiotic resistance, the risk of zoonotic disease, uh, those type of things. And those perhaps need to be addressed at a policy level as opposed to a transactional level by targeting, for example, emissions from a, a care of site itself. I can jump in and, and take a crack at it. Alexis, I, I think you also had something. I hope you had something to say. So let me let me say two words and then I'll pass it over. I, I completely agree with you. Um, you know, I it's a farm bill year. Like this is the time to be thinking about uh, how our national legislation um, props up the, the very system that you just described. Of course, yeah, uh, something like uh, what half of our half of our farmed acres um, is used for is used for animal feed, something like that. I and mean, when I was at at Harvard, the animal law there was um, a scholar at the animal law program who was working on trying to identify all of the ways that our current uh, farm system subsidizes animal agriculture. And of course, there are specific there's the things that we talked about in terms of non enforcement. Um, or, or safe harbor provisions in, in environmental laws, but there's also just a ton of active uh, subsidization of inputs into the system. Um, I'd say on, on a hopeful note, the, there's been a lot more attention paid in the past couple of years to, um, to true cost or full cost accounting methods, trying to actually document, you know, what, is the, what does the balance sheet actually look like um, for factory farms and, and more broadly for the food system generally, um, what are both the positive and negative, I don't want to talk in, in economic terms too much, but you know, what are the externalities um, and how do we start to incorporate those into the actual cost um, of the food that we're eating, both as a way to you know, help uh, eaters make better decisions, um, but I'm much more interested in the way that it can help policymakers make better policy, um, because I think that that's, that's how you, you get systems changed, not, not because we as consumers are making different decisions at the grocery store under all of the constraints. Like you walk into the grocery store and, and your choices are, are pretty constrained by the food system writ large. But I think 
in terms of public policy, there are lots of ways um, that we can think about how to more efficiently and, and more productively use uh, the resources that we have as a society. Yeah, briefly, I, those are all great points and I'm really excited anytime we can talk about the farm bill and upstream emissions. So that's wonderful. I think uh, what I'm hearing in that comment, I guess, uh, is the idea that there is a problem with this industry and the way the industry operates and the way the industry is regulated as opposed to a few bad actor, <laughs> horribly run CAFOs. Um, and I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. You know, we we work with a number of folks who have previously operated CAFOs or who have friends and family members who operate CAFOs and work at CAFOs. And, you know, it's it's true that there are people who are trying to do their best in a really difficult system. I, CAFOs are a really concerning industry, but they're not the only industry that pollutes. They're the only industry that sort of gets a free pass in the way they do. So I, I like the idea of focusing on the industry and the failure to regulate an industry as opposed to, you know, um, being blinded by some particularly bad entities or, or questioning the motives of people who are, who are trying to exist within the system. Um, I think that the industry-wide approach is helpful. And I think from look at looking at what the USDA does in terms of subsidizing industries and the concern that we have as a country about the Chinese, too many people forget the fact that Smithfield, for example, is a wholly owned Chinese company. And as a result, we are subsidizing those farms that are Smithfield owned, although they are Chinese. Are we not going to finally address that in this side of the subsidy um, equation as we are trying to do in other areas? Um, and I'm sometimes surprised that we don't think about where our federal dollars, where our own tax dollars are going and who we're subsidizing when we put these huge farm bills together with all of these subsidies. And they have benefited from it. I think we've got time for one more quick question. Thank you all for being here. Uh, you can't see the room, but there's a room full of students who are motivated to action and really inspired and at least speaking for myself concerned. Um, so aside from what you all are doing, which is so valuable, um, which is actually having jobs in this field, how can we right now as law students and just as, as people effectuate any sort of change? How can we advocate what sort of changes can we make in our own lives and in, in the lives of those around us right now? Thank you. I think one thing you can do is just make better choices. Um, we've started doing it here. Um, we found um, a farmer, African-American farmer, which is rare, um, very young farmer who's trying to maintain a farm and he sustainably grows his food. So anytime we have an event, we, we buy sustainably. Um, it doesn't cost that much more than that food that you're getting out of the grocery store that has absolutely no taste. I think uh, Lee can probably tell you that he's tasted some of, of the food that we provide and there is a substantially different taste. There's a qualitative taste of that food versus the other. Um, and, and I think just, just that's something very basic that we all can do to force, hopefully force the industry to do something differently. Although now um, Smithfield is trying to sustainably raised. So I guess they're recognizing that there's that need in the marketplace. So the challenge becomes, um, do we then let them create the market for sustainably raised produce and, uh, and our food products? And what does that mean in the long run since they've made such a mess of industrialized hog farming at this point? But that's an easy one. Um, I'm sure Lee and Alexis can talk about some of the more difficult ones. Are y'all hiring Alexis? <laughs> I mean, I, I, where would I begin? I, first of all, what a beautiful room. Um, thanks for, thanks for coming and paying attention. This is, um, you, I, get to know the issues right like i i would say that 
what has made me most hopeful in the past couple of years is not I like I don't we don't win a lot right like Sherry and I and Alexis we don't we don't win very often um we try to celebrate when we do but it's it feels like a losing battle most of the time um what makes me hopeful is uh how I've seen <laughs> um more and more people come to this issue to get under this tent it's a big lumpy tent that's trying to do CAFO work um, but people come because they're animal rights people people come because they're EJ people um, people come because they're local food people or they're food justice people or they're small farm people um, and once you get in the tent it's hard not to start bumping into other people and, and meeting them and learning why they care about this issue. I'll be very honest, I did not come to factory farms as an issue because um, of my interest in environmental justice. And now that is most of uh, the work that I do and I'm, and I'm happy about that. But I came you know, because I, I cared about the animals and because, um, because I cared about the small farm economy um, that that I wanted to build, you know, in my in my own area. So I would say we all come to this work um, for different reasons, but we're all on the same team. And um, so get to know the other folks in that room, figure out what motivates them, and then figure out what you want to do about it. So we're we're about to wrap up just because we need to let everyone get to class. But Alexis, do you have any um, final thoughts on on that question? Um, we would love to to hear that quickly. And I want to hold anyone late. I'll be really quick. I love what Lee said. I think looking for opportunities for connection is so important. Um, I'm really glad that Lee and Sherry talked about biogas. They're the experts and. Uh, it's a hugely urgent problem. I don't want to detract from that by saying, I think it's also a really good case study for people who are thinking about being environmental practitioners. I think it sort of shows how important it is to consider the whole problem. You cannot let yourself be entirely consumed about climate change and not considering water pollution and not considering public health. Um, so looking for connections both with other practitioners and in the work you're doing to make sure you're not getting siloed. Um, and then I, I don't know, I'll, I'll mention the farm bill again as a quick last approach. It's a huge bill. It's so complicated. I, you know, I spent years loving the time I didn't have to spend thinking about the farm bill. But it's fascinating if you get into it and opportunities to learn about things like that, make sure that huge decisions aren't taking place, you know, in an area that you're hiding from because it's scary and complicated. I, there's a lot of opportunity to influence policymaking if you take the time to, you know, educate yourself and your friends and get engaged. And there's and no better hiring. place, there's, <laughs> there's no better place to get involved in the farm bill than at Harvard Law School. So go do it. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much for joining the panel and for an amazing discussion today. Um, so please join me in giving a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for your time.